Well, good evening, church. It's lovely uh, to be able to meet together this evening through what is a difficult format still, but it's still encouraging nonetheless that we're able to uh, do these kind of format and uh, get to know each other still a little bit better. As Nathan mentioned last week, we are having an opportunity for some Q&A tonight. So uh, Will, unfortunately, couldn't be with us. So I get the uh, opportunity to compare and put you guys through your paces in terms of questions and how uh, we can respond to what has been, um, again, somehow 2020 continues to throw up even more challenging news cycles and differences that our world is going through. So the first question that we've been asked is, what do you think our response as believers should be to the recent protests and issues over race in the media? It's a, it's a really difficult question to answer because the best thing I can do is probably point you to the Gospel Coalition site. There was a, a great article written there by a black African a hip-hop artist, believe it or not, and he was just writing in terms of his experience growing up in America, uh, of what it was like and the kinds of things that he had to endure as growing up. So I think when I read that, it gave me a greater insight to some of the issues. And I'm hmm. reluctant to comment on another country and reluctant to comment too much on what's going on there because I'm not there on the ground. I don't understand some of the deeper issues. I probably view it at a, at a more superficial level than what I would view it if I was in America. And, and so it, it gives me a kind of reluctance. I read a, another article on some of the um, uh, going on in, in some of the protests that have been happening and some of the underlying issues that have come up in those process, uh, protests and uh, some of the uh, background to some of the groups who are involved and even that is, is, is rather frightening. How do we support brothers and sisters? I think it's very hard from a distance to do that. I, I think it's very difficult for us to uh, really be able to relate to those uh, in America who may be undergoing those things precisely because we are not there and precisely because it might be misinterpreted. So mm. if you were to ask me, I would say the best way, certainly one of the best ways we can do that is by praying for them and uh, praying that, that God will help bring some sense of healing amongst the relationships there. I would pray even more so for the gospel because I think the only solution mm. to the problem is the gospel. I think if you want to see that race relationships really healed, then the only way that's going to happen is through people being converted, being united to Christ, having a, having a common person in the Lord Jesus Christ that binds them together. And, and so I'd be praying that the gospel goes out even more clearly and that more and more people get saved, get converted, get transformed, and thus are able to relate better to one another. And then I would say at a personal level, I think one has to constantly uh, ask yourself the question, am I showing any signs of racism? Are there any parts of me that may indeed mm. be a little bit racist? And ask yourself that question, be honest with yourself, and ensure, at least in the way in which you operate in our society, that all people are being treated equally, no matter what their cultural background is. There is, of course, only one race, mm. the human race, and we are all part of that human race. So in some sense, all of us are related to each other. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. There, I just, I guess, there's so many opinions at the moment. So, I'm, what's one extra voice in the mix? Um, but I think one of the obvious answers that we can see is that protesting is just not the answer. What we can see, this thing that's supposed to fix it and make a stand, what really has been the fruit of the protesting? Violence, more sin, uh, more distinction between colour. Uh, so I don't think, obviously, that just hasn't gone down well. People making a, their voices heard through protesting, it's not the answer. Um, but again, just piggybacking on what you've said, as, as cliche as it sounds, with, with all the different remedies, my mind goes to Ephesians 2, where it talks about Christ has become our peace. And when we look back at first century, the, the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles, the hostility there, between pagans who, you know, sacrificed their children to gods was just repulsive to Jews. And Jews who worshipped one God in the eyes of pagans was absolutely repulsive. They hated each other. 
And then yet Paul says, how has God dealt with this? And he says that Christ has destroyed the hostility between the two. And he's made, two, he's made one man out of the two. And that was only through Christ. So what you've said, Ian, the, the, really the, uh, the preaching of the gospel is our only hope to bring peace. He is our peace. And therefore he can say, as you said last week's sermon, in Christ now there is neither Jew nor Gentile. He shatters that separation. So highlighting our differences isn't going to help. Um, but preaching Christ, as you've said, uh, is the only opportunity. The protesting is not going to help. It just highlights the differences. Mm. Um, so that's kind of where my mind is. I think that should be our real response and how we talk to the congregation about that. Mm. Highlighting the gospel, it is the only chance. Mm. Um, well, certainly some detailed responses there. And for those who are interested, that article is by an artist named Shay Lin. And if you're mm. like me and into some more interesting music, he's also a really good place to start if you're into Christian hip-hop. So. Mm definitely a good thing Which to start. I'm not. But <laughs> I'm surprised, Ian. I'm surprised that you're, you're not into Christian hip-hop. Now, you shouldn't have invited me to do this because you realise that discussion has, of course, prompted me to ask my own question. <laughs> how as Christians, if something is happening in the world that we do object to, how as Christians should we protest? What does Christian protest look like? <laughs> That's a, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Thanks, Scott. I, I think that uh, one has to be careful that whatever means of protest you engage in, and I don't necessarily think that uh, you can't go out and have a open protest where you gather together with people surrounded by a cause, common cause, but I think you have to ensure that your motivations are right. You have to ensure that... Uh, your protest is peaceful because I think one of the dangers of, of any kind of protest is when it becomes violent and gets out of hand. I think you have to, in your, if you're going to protest, I think you have to do it in a way that is, is going to promote ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ, as mm. cliched as that sounds. Yeah. And I think you have to be careful that you don't allow the issues to become bigger than the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. I think it's easy to get lost in issues and for the issues to take over. So yes, I think you, you, you may want to protest, for example, when the whole same-sex marriage uh, issue came up in Australia, there was a group who got together and went down and, and had a peaceful gathering together uh, in Sydney and who objected to the same-sex marriage. Uh, so I think there, there's a place for that. I think... Um, you know, the best form, in, in my view anyway, and, and mm. this, may be, uh, this may be disputed, I think the best form of protesting is actually to get down on your knees and pray. Because if you're going to see change, it has to yeah. begin with prayer. And, and I think that's fundamental. If you want to see God move, uh, you need to get uh, uh, on your knees praying. Because ultimately, mm. what, what changes a society is repentance. I know yeah. I'm sounding cliched now, but... That's it. Uh, it you know, when people turn away from this and, uh, and turn towards Christ, there's your solution. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, where we're different to f first century Christianity is that we're in a democracy. Mm. So kind of the instructions that we get in the Bible, we've got a different context. But I think principles still remain, you know, honour honor the king, mm. uh, be peaceable, show honour and respect to everyone. So there is a place in democracy to let our voice be heard, whether it's on social media, wherever it is. But as soon as we start crossing that line where it gets uh, violent, where it gets aggressive, I mean, even not just this recent protest, but majority of protests, you just see it. there's aggression in the voice, there's shouting, there's demanding. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's very rarely peaceable. So do we, do we want to risk that? Can we be part of a protest that's not... Uh, that's not eruptive. Um, I think we need to consider that, but spot on. And, and just quickly, on some other issues in terms of protesting, you're saying how, I think there's uh, avenues to write to your MPs mm. uh, on certain issues, so you can, you can write letters to MPs. You can even go, which we did as a church, you can meet with your, your local MP and you can have a discussion about what it is that, that's plaguing you. So there are those kinds of avenues where your voice can be heard. As you said, Nathan, we live in a democracy and that mm. is part of the democratic process that we live in and that we do have avenues yeah. outside of protests as well to make our voices heard. Absolutely. Do you think modern Christians neglect the practice of fasting as part of the Christian life? Now, I certainly can't say that I 
uh, practice <laughs> terribly well. So how do you think fasting impacts us these days? I'm going to get Nathan to do the next question first, but I have to start this one because yeah. I've got a little story to tell you and, yeah. and then we'll answer the question. <laughs> when I was at university, I went to a lecture on, uh, a, a Christian lecture on fasting. It was by a guy who practiced fasting and it was at a SEA Student Christian Association at university in South Africa. And there were about 40 or 50 students there and he stood up and, and, and gave his view on fasting. And uh, then he said to us, he actually did a 40-day fast where he, he you know, emulated and only had water and, and so mm. on on that 40-day fast. And, yeah. and, and I was amazed. I must admit, he looked like a grain of rice. And, and when I saw how thin he was, I decided after that I was never going to fast. <laughs> I'm not days. saying you should never fast. I think <laughs> there is a place for Christian fasting. But I think one's got to do it with the right motives because Jesus talks about fasting and not showing that you're fasting, not visibly demonstrating as though this is, look at me, look how well I'm doing, I'm fasting. And I think when we fast, the fasting is not so much that God is going to answer our prayers because, again, you can turn God into an idol and you can mm -hmm. try and use fasting as a means of manipulation to get God to bend to whatever your will is or what you would like it to be. But I think fasting is a means to remind us of our dependence upon God. Mm. It thrusts us back to realize that in the totality of our being, we are completely dependent upon God. So I know my wife, for example, at times has had a day fast. I've had a day fast mm. uh, where I've just stopped having food just to remind myself that I am dependent upon God, not because there are necessarily any issues. Sometimes when there have been issues, we've had a fast. I haven't said to the Lord, I want you to answer in a particular way. I've just said, Lord, just give me a clearer uh, understanding of what you want in this situation but I, I never want to use it as a means to try and um, cajole God into, into answering me but I do think there, there is a, a place for fasting in the Christian life uh, Nathan yeah. I don't know what your yeah. view is no no I, um, in, in direct response to the question I definitely do think it is neglected and not spoken of much mm. t today I mean you go through church history and you just see it was a practice uh, in the, in the, throughout the church uh, throughout the church's life um, you don't really see explicit commands in the new testament no. for it paul gives a lot of right. commands you don't um, but what i've noticed is that um, it's quite implied so in the passage that you had mentioned ian in uh, matthew 6 jesus says when you fast you. and he's talking to disciples so that's implied and there is a sense of encouragement there where he says you know don't don't let people know about it so these announced fasts fasts aren't always biblical mm -hmm. Um, but he does say, when you do it in secret, your father who sees in secret will reward you. He will see what you're doing. So again, not a genie-like thing, but he sees the heart behind it. Mm. And then you also get in um, uh, with uh, John's disciples coming to Jesus and saying, why don't your disciples fast? Why don't you guys fast? And Jesus' answer was really interesting that um, he says, is it fitting to mourn and fast while the bridegroom's here? And so how could they be fasting and mourning and weeping when the Messiah was here? But then his response is interesting. Yeah. Then, but when the bridegroom is taken away, then they will fast. So there's your implied, he, he expects that his disciples will fast when he comes. What does that fasting look like? Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Um, but for me, just, for me, just personally, again, there's lots of views. So, you know, you, you can hear a lot of different things. All I can say is with, when I have fasted in the past, I can honestly say, um, and I don't do it very regularly at all, but when I have, it has been uh, some of the most focused time mm. of prayer and drawing near to God. So it's I didn't, true. the things that I actually prayed for during that time, I don't think I saw an answer to the actual prayer requests I was making, but the communion that I enjoyed with God, I, I can't deny it. Mm. Um, and, and I actually found when I was preparing for it that, pretty much every single time that the food hasn't been an issue normally on a normal day if i went without my lunch meal i'd be aching for it mm. but when i'm coming into it drawing near to the lord it's almost it almost becomes easy for that mm. day because mm. the lord meets with you in a way but again that might not happen for everyone i'm just speaking an experience here but what's not so much commanded in scripture i think is quite implied and then you see in acts over and over again the church doing it in conjunction with their prayer and seeking god for guidance 
Um, so I think it's helpful. Yeah, if I can just quickly add to that, I, I think it is an area of freedom. But I, mm. I, just to, to you know, echo what, and I agree with what um, uh, is being said by Nathan, um, is that I, I think in those times where perhaps there is a, an issue you're trying to get some guidance of, you, 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 not necessarily that you'll get. When I was between churches and I was, had been approached by a church, I took a day where I, I fasted. I went away to one of the dams in Queensland and just sat there the whole day reading scripture, mm. praying and, and, and fasting. Um, I don't know if I was any closer to an answer at the end of that day. But what was interesting, when I, when I came back from that and one of the men at the church who knew I was doing that came to see me in the evening, he said to me, your face is glowing. It must be that you've been spending time in prayer. And I said, well, actually, it's because I'm a bit sunburned. <laughs> 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 so, so, so. so the yeah. answer is be considerate about where you fast yeah. <laughs> as well I as when. fast in the sun. Yeah, exactly. We might do one more and then um, we'll move into the sermon. So maybe, Nathan, if you want to answer this one first, what central biblical teaching do you think isn't emphasised enough in Christianity today? Yep. Big question. Central, yep. Um, Look, let me just just give two real real quickly. I think, um, firstly, I would think uh, probably church discipline um, in a time where church membership isn't really practiced much in the people's view of the church. Uh, For example, I mean, you can attest to this, Ian, uh, in probably all of your pastoring, whenever there's an issue or something and you have to go and meet with someone and confront about sin, um, so many of the times the natural response is when you confront someone, well, if if that's what you think, we'll just pack up and move churches. So you never really, whenever someone's confronted, they just leave. Um, whereas you see in the scriptures as this tight knit, uh, they are a body, and so you go through church discipline process to restore the person. But when people just leave, when there's so many churches available, mm. uh, and you go to your preference where things are comfortable, uh, so I think churches are backed off on church discipline because people just pack up and go, and so they've kind of just avoided it, try and keep people in, um, really to our neglect because it's commanded by Jesus and Paul. Um, and the second one I would say. Uh, key teaching is the second coming i mean and and really you know what's being taught regularly or what's not being taught regularly by what christians talk about when do you ever hear people talking about the second coming or talk about how they're making choices in life based upon the imminent return of christ and so when it's not on the lips it means it's not in the mind um and so i just think i remember there was a period uh, in the 90s and probably even before Mm, i mean i was mm. i was younger yeah, in the 90s so uh, but there was just a lot of sermons on it I don't know how good they were back then but there was just a lot of talk about it probably to the extreme where it was fanaticism mm. but then it completely went to the other end and now it's more about the here and now investing in this life success prosperity gospels booming so the second coming doesn't really fit with the prosperity gospel because mm. mm. you're building an empire here and Jesus coming gets in the way mm. of that so I think that's probably two things immediately come to mind yeah, I, just to echo the second coming, that uh, I, I remember our, our principal saying to us, um, you guys need to go and preach on, on the second coming because it's not, it's not dealt with. And I think in mm. the 1780s, there was an overemphasis and those movies came out, you know, Left Behind, The, the Beast, and, and I think all of that sensationalized it. And, and I think that's probably what caused there to be a reaction against that. Mm. Um, if you had asked me, I think, if you had asked me theologically, Theologically, I would say the issue that you never hear about is how the law relates to the gospel. <laughs> it's, it's a subject that is never really covered in Scripture, and I think because there's a lot of uncertainty around how law and gospel fit together. And so you either hear about the law or you hear about the gospel, but you very rarely hear how the law uh, goes through the Old Testament and then into the New Testament, how the New Testament understands the Old Testament law and how they relate to each other. If I were to think in terms of the church globally now, I think, and not necessarily in this church, so mm. I'm not thinking in terms of this church, but globally, I think one of the biggest issues we deal with is a lack of understanding of the authority of Scripture. And I think because there's a lack of teaching on the authority of Scripture, there's a lack of discernment in churches. 
And as a result of the lack of discernment in churches, it's a free for all in many places. And when, you, and, and when I say the authority of Scripture, I'm not just talking about believing that this is the Bible or the Word of God. I think the area of the authority of Scripture that is neglected most is the sufficiency of Scripture. Yeah. Because we will believe that it's written by God, it's without error. But when it comes to its sufficiency, that's where I think the problem lies. And some people say, well, we've got Scripture and then we've got. And they'll add a whole lot of extra things. So I would say... For me, that's a, a big area. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Well, thank you both, um, Ian. I look forward to your two your <laughs> two year long uh, series on the law and the gospel and how that's going to impact. So strap in for that one. Excellent. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be very good. So uh, again, thank you so much for your time, gentlemen, and Thanks your thoughts. Lot. Thank and you. Hopefully, this will be a, a regular occurring theme, even once things go back to whatever normal ends up being, and we're able to meet yeah. in person. Um, and we're now going to move on to the sermon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you are all still keeping well. I think it's fantastic that some of the lockdowns are slowly but surely uh, being removed. And I read something in the paper today. I hope they're right that they're talking about the possibility of opening, opening up stadiums on the 1st of July. If they open up stadiums on the 1st of July, it bodes well that they may well allow us as a church also to open up on the 1st of the J uh, July. So keep praying and keep asking in the Lord and let's hope that we can get to be together sooner rather than later. We're coming to the end of our series in John. It's not a lot to go, and uh, we've got to the end of chapter 20. I'm going to read from John chapter 20, and I'm reading from verses 24 to 29. So if you have your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or a Bible like I have in my hands or an iPad or on computer, can I encourage you to turn to John chapter 20, verses 24 through to 29. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word that continues to speak to us today. What a great privilege it is to have it and to be able to read it and to hear what you have to say to us through it. We are so grateful that you came, that you revealed yourself, that you moved upon the writers of Scripture in such a powerful way that as they wrote these words, they wrote exactly what you wanted them to write. We are so grateful that the word we have is an inspired word of God, without error, all authoritative and sufficient. And we pray, O oh God, that as we spend some time reading about Jesus' encounter with his disciples and particularly with Thomas, oh, that you would open our eyes, that you would give us insight, that you would reveal yourself to us again, that our hearts might be warmed, that our spirits might be revived, that our minds might be informed, that our ears might be opened, and that you Lord Jesus Christ, would you ex exalt yourself in our midst and we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you have read the book The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which is written by C.S. Lewis, that wonderful epic 
uh, of books written about the, the children who experience, the four children who experience this fantasy world, or seen the movie Narnia, then you will remember how the children stumble across Narnia. Lucy first ends up in Narnia when she goes to hide in the cupboard. You remember they're playing hide and seek in this old house in England and she goes and hides in this cupboard and suddenly as she goes further and further into the cupboard, it takes her into this world beyond the cupboard. When she comes back and says to the other children, I, I've been into this incredible world, none of them believe her. They all think she's lying. Now, Lucy apparently is prone to telling a few tall ones, and so they just dismiss her. They don't believe. And then while Edward, while following Lucy into the cupboard later that night, also stumbles upon Narnia. However, when they both get back, Lucy tells Edward to tell Peter and Susan about the experience. They do not believe her story. And they think she's making it all up and has a rather vivid imagination. The following day, they're playing cricket in the garden. And Edward hits the ball into the house and it breaks a window. The children rush into the house to see the damage, only to hear the housekeeper ranting and raving as she comes to find them and scold them. They all then run to the same cupboard to hide only to stumble into Narnia. In an instant, all their doubts are removed. Now they've gone from doubt to faith, from unbelief to belief. Where once they doubted Lucy's word, having been confronted now with irrefutable proof, they now have total faith, total belief. It's an incredible transformation. After all, it would be pretty difficult to deny the facts, wouldn't it? Thomas is about to have all of his doubts turned into faith. Here is a man who has pessimistically not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, when Jesus appears to Thomas, in a moment, in an instant, all the doubts are washed away. And Thomas goes from this person who made certain demands, as we will see, to suddenly confessing this incredible words that come out of his mouth, my Lord, my God. Once he's encountered the risen Christ, there is no other option. Irrefutable proof has been presented in front of his eyes. And all he can do is confess him as Lord. Firstly, I want you to notice the proof that Thomas required. The proof that Thomas required. In fact, I should really title that the proof that Thomas demanded. Because Thomas demands certain proof. He is not with the other disciples in the previous encounter that Jesus has had with them. And so when the other disciples come to Thomas and they say, we have seen the Lord. Thomas is the ultimate skeptic. Thomas maybe thinks that they've seen an apparition, a ghost, we're not told. But what we do know is that Thomas simply refuses to take their word for it. Now what I find really interesting about this is Thomas is not an agnostic, someone who believes there is a God but we can't know him. Neither is Thomas and atheist who doesn't believe in God. Thomas is a disciple of Jesus. He has spent the last three years of his life living with Jesus, walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, asking questions, involving himself in discussions with Jesus. So here we're talking about someone who has been well versed and yet, and yet, he doesn't believe and he makes certain demands. If Thomas is going to believe, then Thomas wants to be able to touch those wounds. He wants to place his finger in the wounds on Jesus' hands. He wants to take his hand and thrust it into the side, or at least to see the proof of the marks, because he wants to know irrefutably that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, by nature, of course, which plays into Thomas's skepticism, is that Thomas is a pessimistic. You know that there are 
people in this world, you get optimists and you get pessimists. You get those who view everything almost negatively and always see all the problems before they see the possibilities. You get others who are overly optimistic, who only see possibilities and never see the problems. And then you get somewhere a little bit in between. Uh, and so it's not necessarily one or the other. Thomas falls into the pessimistic category. How do I know that? Well, there are other instances. Remember in John chapter 11, verse 6, remember when Jesus is summoned by Mary and Martha because their brother Lazarus is sick and she has sent a message. They have sent a message to Jesus to summon him and say, please come, our brother is sick and you're the only one that can help. And so uh, Jesus gets the message and says, okay, we need to head to Jerusalem. What does Thomas do? Well, let me read it to you so to see that I'm not making these things up. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there, uh, let me just read, for two more days. And then when Thomas hears they're going to go to Lazarus, this is what, how he replies to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Jew. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is where he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After they said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking about his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now hear, hear what Thomas says. That's the background. Verse 16. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Here's Thomas, the, the ultimate pessimist. He doesn't want to go back to Jerusalem, because if he goes back to Jerusalem, he's scared that they're going to all die, and they're all going to end up being sacrificed like the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, by nature, a pessimist. Matthew 27, verse 42, we have other doubters in the Scriptures. Let me read that passage to you. It's not only Thomas. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Here is a different kind of skepticism. Now these Pharisees and Sadducees are saying, if you are really the Christ, then show us a sign. Give us some kind of irrefutable proof that we might know that you are the Christ. Or, remember, when Jesus is on the cross and he's dying, some of the crowd and the soldiers turn to him and look to him and say, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. But it is precisely because Jesus is the Son of God that he cannot come down from the cross. This is skepticism at its worst. This is the doubting and the questioning whether or not Jesus is the Christ. And now this is not coming from those who are aggressively opposed to Jesus like Sadducees and Pharisees or coming from the soldiers and the crowds at the cross. This is now coming from one of Jesus' own. I don't believe says Thomas. Now it's a really strong way in which this is expressed. I try to bring it out in the reading. In the original language, it comes out in the double negative in the Greek. When you've got the double negative, it's there because it's wanting to emphasize something. So if I can put it like this, Thomas digs his heels in and he says emphatically, I will Definitely not believe unless his demands are met. I want to touch him. I want to feel him. Now, Thomas's experience is true today of so many different experiences of people. Sometimes you have those who are already at church and have been going to church for a long time. 
And yet, in spite of hearing the gospel message again and again and again, there is something just preventing them from taking that extra step to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I encountered this and have encountered this in all the churches I've pastored. In one of the churches, not this one that I was pastoring, there was a man whose wife was a believer and he wasn't. And he began coming to church with his wife. And he would come consistently Sunday after Sunday. I went to visit him in his home and we had a long discussion and I left at about 11, 11.30. Uh, and then I went back again and had another discussion with him. And, and after a couple of discussions, as we talked about theology, as we talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, as I went through the gospel with him, as I tried to help him to understand the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was always something that prevented him from taking the next step. And I remember sitting in that home trying to convince him and say, John, uh, this is true. You just need to allow and not allow your intellectual objections to get in the way of exercising faith and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we allow our minds to dominate and we allow our minds to prevent us from actually submitting in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I'll never forget that after one of those conversations, it wasn't very long afterwards, I got a phone call from his brother. He said to me, Ian, John has just died. I couldn't believe it. He was 43 years old. I said to him, what happened? He said he went to play basketball with these two sons outdoor in an area in Brisbane. And while he was playing basketball, he just collapsed. And they discovered later that he had a blood clot and that had caused him to have an aneurysm and he died. Here was a man who was so close. He was almost there. And God in his grace sent me along to this man because he knew it was only a matter of time before he would no longer be in this world. And yet there was this refusal to believe. Oh, my dear friend, don't let that be you. Maybe there is just this little blockage. Faith means that sometimes not all of our questions are answered. Faith means that sometimes we live with these doubts, if I can put it like that, because not everything is clear. And faith requires us to put our hand in the hand of the master and to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to understand everything. There still may be some questions that are not finally and ultimately resolved after all. If you and I could answer every question, we would have all knowledge. And if we had all knowledge, we would be God. But we will never be God. And so don't allow those nagging questions in the back of your mind to become the stumbling block that prevents you from bowing at the foot of the cross. Jesus reaches out to you and says, Come, come. Find life. Turn away from your rebellion. Embrace me and I will lift the burden of your sin. Secondly, I want you to see the proof that Jesus required. Verses 27 to 29. The proof that Jesus required. Let me read those verses again. Verses 27 to 29. Proof that Jesus provided. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. In fact, Jesus, as he appears the second time, Thomas is there. 
And now he deals with Thomas's doubts. Now notice, he deals with him initially gently. He understands Thomas's dilemma. And he, he meets his, all his requirements. Uh, now, when you think about that, what a, an incredible way of dealing with Thomas. He literally says to him, touch, feel. He doesn't rebuke him initially. He doesn't say to him, Thomas, you, you, you bad person. Why didn't you believe like the rest of the disciples? What's wrong with you, Thomas? Get your head screwed on right. Is it that difficult a, a thing to believe in me? Why don't you trust the word of them? No, no, no. Jesus comes gently to him. And you heard Pastor Nathan so eloquently last week speak about that word shalom. Shalom, he says. Peace be with you. And then he addresses Thomas. He wants to deal with the doubts of Thomas. And he wants to answer those doubts. And he wants to help take Thomas from a position of unbelief to a position of belief. He doesn't crush him. He doesn't dismiss him. He doesn't write him off. He doesn't say, okay, well, Thomas, uh, you're done for now. I'll, I'll move on to someone else who's got more faith than you. No, Jesus takes that frail faith of Thomas and he begins to fortify it by saying to Thomas, Thomas, here is the proof right in front of your eyes. There is no reason for you no longer to not believe. Now, he proves to Thomas that he's not just an apparition. You see, one of the issues Thomas may have had is that Jesus Christ, uh, he, he might have thought, was just a, a ghost that appeared to the disciples. We're not told. It's a, we, we, we run sure. But the bodily form of Jesus Christ removes any possibility that this is just some ghostly apparition that is appearing. No, this is Jesus in the flesh. This is Jesus with bones. This is Jesus with flesh. This is a Jesus who talks. This is a Jesus who sees. This is a Jesus you can touch. This is a Jesus you can feel. It's so very important to understand that when Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, he is raised bodily from the dead. It's not a spiritual resurrection that takes place, as some liberal scholars seem to think. This is a literal resurrection. This is a bodily resurrection. And the reason it's so important that Jesus is bodily raised from the dead is because it signifies and it demonstrates the acceptability of God the Father's a uh, uh, stamp of approval on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he raises him from the dead is God's way of saying I have accepted the sacrifice that he has offered on behalf of sinners. There's another reason why it's important that Jesus Christ is bodily raised from the dead. And I've said this previously so I'm not going to spend time here. But it is so that in the same way that he is raised, Paul informs us in 1 Corinthians 15, we will be raised. In other words, his body is the guarantee that all who are in Christ one day when Jesus returns will receive a new spiritual body, a body that is like his. Now, notice how he addresses Thomas. It's very important that we have this. Now, I'm going to try and interpret this the way it comes out in the Greek. The tense that is used here is the present tense. The mood of the verb is the imperative. So there's a command, and it's in the present tense. Now, the present tense in the Greek means ongoing, continuous action. It doesn't mean something that's just happening in the now, but it's an ongoing action. The aorist, the aorist mood means that it's complete. All right, so here we go. When he says to Thomas, Stop 
doubting yesterday. Start believing yesterday. That's the nature of that verb. Jesus is saying, Thomas, stop acting like an unbeliever. Start acting like a believer yesterday. It is important. He must do it now. And so as uh, Jesus confronts Thomas in the imperative uh, is in the mood and in the aorist tense, he says to him, Thomas, make sure that you don't allow those doubts that have caused all kinds of fears to permeate your mind and cause you not to believe in me. Put those things to bed. Put them to death and do it now. Do it as if you were doing it yesterday and start believing now and don't stop believing now. Keep on keeping on believing. It's so important that Thomas responds to what is in front of him and notice Thomas's reaction. Interesting, very interesting. He doesn't touch Jesus. Do you see that in the text? It doesn't say Thomas then reached forward after Jesus gave him the opportunity and put his hand in his side and touched the wounds. Seeing Jesus is enough. Seeing those nail-scarred hands is enough. Seeing the wound in the side is enough. What Thomas does now is make a remarkable confession. Listen to that confession. He says, My Lord, and my God, that's a very good translation, by the way. It brings out the force of what's going on with Thomas. In effect, what Thomas is now acknowledging, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is not just an ordinary man. That confession that Thomas makes expresses its ultimate meaning about who Jesus is. It is a revelation of the person of Jesus. And it speaks to us to the depths of who Christ is. In other words, my dear friends, Christ is not just someone who has come as a human being. Christ is not just another great prophet. Christ is not just a great man. Christ is not just a great leader, but rather Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, both at the same time. And we must never, ever for a moment diminish his humanity or diminish his deity. Both those sides of Jesus must be equally emphasized. And Thomas now accords to Jesus the rightful title of my Lord, my God. This is the God-man who has come into the society. Why is that so critical? Why is it so important that we do not lose sight of the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that he's not just an ordinary man? Well, for this reason. In order for our sin, our rebellion against God to be dealt with, it meant that someone had to come into this world who was not like us in the sense that they were born with their an already sinful nature inherited from our parents. If Jesus was only human, then he would have been born a sinner like us. He would have been blemished like us. And he could have never presented himself to God on our behalf as a perfect sacrifice because he would have been tainted by his sinfulness. That's why Jesus comes not just as a man, but as God incarnated, God made man, God who is both God and man simultaneously. He is born perfect, which is why the Apostle Paul refers to him as the second Adam. Why the second Adam? Because like the first Adam, who was created perfect and was free from sin, Jesus is also perfect and also created 
completely free, or not created, rather revealed completely free from sin. He has no sin in him. He is perfect from the start. And now, being born as the perfect man, he has the opportunity to do what Adam and you and I have failed to do. What have Adam and you and I failed to do? We have failed to live in perfect obedience and submission to God. We have failed to live 100% to the glory of God. We have all turned away from God. We have all disobeyed God. We have all turned to our own ways. We have all exerted our own wills above and above God's will. Janice and I have been trawling while we've been in this COVID-19, trawling through some home videos that we took of our boys when they were much younger and we were still in Brisbane at the very first church I had the privilege and joy of pastoring. And Janice was filming Michael on one of our dining room churches. He must have been around about three when she was filming this. And he, initially he was sitting on the, chair, on, on the chair and then he stood up on the chair. And Janice, as she was videoing him, said to Michael, sit down. And he looked at her and stared her in the face and said, no. And the camera stopped. And Janice and I, when we watched that, burst out laughing because we knew the camera stopped because Janice implemented some discipline because of his defiance. He's turning around and saying, no. That's what you and I have said to God because by nature, we are sinners. Jesus comes as the second perfect man. And he lives his entire life perfectly in submission and obedience to God the Father. In every action, he glorifies God. That's why at his baptism, God says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. He listens to me. Jesus obeys God, which is why even in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the greatest agony that lies ahead, as he agonizes in prayer, he prays and he says, if there be any other way, take this cup from me, yet... Not my will, but your will be done. Even in the moment where he knows what lies ahead and how painful it's going to be, even at that moment, he submits to the will of the Father. And it is the will of the Father that he should lose none of all that he, the Father, has given him, but raise them up on that last day. And in order for Jesus to accomplish that great work as the God-man, as God in the flesh, he must present himself before God the Father as the perfect sacrifice. So Peter is able to say in 1 Peter 2, 22, there was, there was no deceit in his mouth and he committed no sin. So that Jesus comes before God as our representative and presents himself perfectly so that he may experience the wrath of God, God's judgment against our sin. And that he pays the penalty that we deserve so that all who trust in him, all who put their faith in him, all who believe in him, all who confess him as Thomas did, my Lord and my God, will have the burden of our sin lifted, will be given eternal life, and one day will go to live with God forever in a new heaven and a new earth. All those who bend their will to the will of God, 
who come before God and present themselves as rebels, those who have sinned against God, those who have turned away from him. Don't offer any excuses. Don't try and justify their rebellion. Don't try and find a reason why they've done what they've done, but simply acknowledge that they have disobeyed God, that they violated God's perfect standards, and they submit themselves to God, and they bring themselves in the totality of their being in absolute, complete submission to the Lordship of Jesus. One of the authors put it like this, and I think he puts it so well in that confession of Thomas. He confesses to the risen Jesus that he belongs to him as his willing subject. He adores him and henceforth will serve him as he deserves. Let me repeat that. I think it's so critically important that we understand it. He confesses to the risen Jesus that he belongs to him as his willing subject. He adores him and henceforth will serve him as he deserves. That sums it up so well. Here is Thomas bowing in humility before Jesus and saying, Jesus, all of me is yours. What an incredible transformation. Here is a man who we meet at the beginning saying, I will not believe unless I see him. Now that he's been confronted with the risen Christ, is able to say, my Lord and my God. When you've had a living encounter with the living Christ, can there be any other response than to fall down on your knees? in humility, and confess him as Lord. I want to close with just a, a story I, I read recently of a girl who was home near, uh, whose home was near a cemetery. And in order to go to the shop, she had to follow a path that led her through that cemetery. But this little girl never seemed to have any sense of fear. Even when she returned through the cemetery at dusk, someone once said to her, aren't you afraid to go through the cemetery? Oh no, she replied. I'm not afraid, for my home is just beyond. Are you afraid of the grave? Are you afraid of death? Are you ever afraid what might happen when your life comes to an end and you are either buried in that cemetery or you are cremated? Or have you confessed Jesus as your Lord and your God? The risen Christ is our evidence that God has made a way back to him. Jesus is the bridge between us and God. And he, through his death on that cross, has enabled us to have our sin placed upon his shoulders. And he pays the penalty for that sin so that we can go free and have the burden lifted so that we can receive forgiveness. And the way in which we receive that forgiveness is to bow as Thomas did at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, to bow at the foot of the cross and to say, yes, Lord, I see it. I know what I am. I won't deny it any longer. I won't run from you any longer. I'm tired of running. I've run long enough. It's been too long, Lord. I'm going to allow those doubts that have sometimes assaged my mind. I'm going to allow those doubts that have sometimes plagued me and crippled me 
and cause me to demand more and more. And I'm going to leave them at the foot of the cross. And I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to put that hand in the hand of the risen Savior. And I'm going to trust you, Lord Jesus Christ, to take away my sin, to give me eternal life, to restore me and reconcile me back to God. And I'm going to do it because I believe that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and is alive. And based on his resurrection, Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust that when my time comes, whenever it is, that like you, one day, I too will be raised back to life from the dead. Oh, my dear friend, don't delay. Don't push him away. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our oh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wonder of the resurrection of Jesus. What a glorious Savior we have one who is alive, one who's coming back, one who is going to take to be with him one day, all those who have a relationship with him, all who love him. Oh Lord, if there be any who are watching that do not know you, unveil their eyes. Show them the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. Draw them to yourself. Remove the objections. Bring them to the cross so that they, like Thomas, may have all their doubts removed and may confess you as my Lord and my God. For Jesus' sake, amen.